all for joining us today to celebrate the opening of the Uri Hero Center for the Advancement of Oceanography. We're going to start today with two Olis. I'd like to introduce to you Kungu Tracy Lopez and Kahaone Lopez. We are sincerely grateful to Mr. and Mrs. Uihiro, Ms. Mika Uihiro, and Dr. Noboro Moriyama, and the entire Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education for your belief in us, your support, and your inspiration. The Uihiro Center for the Advancement of Oceanography is a nexus of consequential support, resources, an opportunity for faculty and students engaged in vital oceanographic research. The center offers a venue where discourse and debate are encouraged as a means to advance oceanographic research and inform policy. The center strengthens the Department of Oceanography, which is one of the top ranked oceanographic institutes in the world. The center is responsive to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals specifically climate action, life below water, clean water, quality education, and gender equality. The center is aligned with the Department of Oceanography's 2022 strategic plan, which was prepared collaboratively through months of interviews, surveys, and department-wide workshops, including 123 of our members. We've just had two beautiful Oli. After I speak today, we'll hear from Dr. Noboro Moriyama. He is the Senior Managing Director of the Uihiro Center, or the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education. We'll then hear from Dr. David Carl, who is part of the Center's Advisory Council. After Dr. Carl, we'll hear from President Lassner, President of the University of Hawaii System. 
You will get to meet our new faculty for the first time all together today. And following that, um, you'll get to hear about our 10 Uihiro Graduate Student Fellows research. I'll give you some closing remarks and then invite you to please join us all on the lanai for a reception. Our advisory council has four members, Dr. Hanani Kane, Dr. David Carl, Dr. Roberto Marinelli, and Mr. Chris Ostrander. The advisory council provides guidance on national and international trends in oceanography, on new technologies that further the United, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and the social impacts of climate change on the people of Hawaii and the Pacific. The three new Uihiro faculty that you'll meet today are Dr. Hyode So. He will be an associate professor in the Department of Oceanography and an associate director of the center. He's a physical oceanographer and a climate scientist. You'll meet Dr. Nissa Silbiger. She will be an associate professor in the Department of Oceanography and an associate director of the center. She is a marine ecologist with a focus in global change ecology. And you'll meet Dr. Sachiko Yoshida. She will be an associate researcher in the Department of Oceanography and the coordinator of the center. She is a physical oceanographer who studies large scale ocean dynamics. It was a very intensive year long search to find these three amazing faculty. And it was an international search. There were eight, nine members from our community who uh, led the search on the search committee. Dr. Carl Edwards was the chair. He was joined by Drs. Seth Bushinsky, Glenn Carter, Henrietta Dulai, Erica Gutza, Kathleen Ruttenberg, Malta Stucker, Angel White, and Ms. Uta Norden, who was our graduate student representative. This search committee interfaced with the center's advisory council the department chairwoman, and all of the Department of Oceanography faculty, staff, and students. Our 10 Uihiro graduate student fellows have been with us since 1 January of 2023. 60% of those students' research pertains to climate action. 40% pertains to life below water, and half of those students are also looking at clean water. The Uihiro Graduate Student Fellows were selected by the Department of Oceanography Awards Committee. That is Dr. Angel White, Dr. Kelvin Richards, and Dr. Nick Hocko. They were selected for their academic excellence and for how their research pertained to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The students' advisors are Department of Oceanography associated faculty across a range of disciplines. In 2023, the center has hosted 11 informative events. The seminars have addressed topics that range from ocean conservation to policy to ethics and science. And Uihiro faculty interviews allowed us to find our new colleagues and professors. In 2024, we look forward to an upcoming research symposium and seven more exciting seminar and workshop events. I'd like to express my gratitude and recognition to the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education, to President Lassner, to Provost Bruno, to Dean Fletcher, and the entire SOAS Dean's Office for their unwavering support, to Mr. Tim Dolan, to Ms. Meredith Yoro, and all of the University of Hawaii Foundation for their professionalism and guidance. To the advisory council members who have selflessly offered their time and guidance and to our new Uihiro faculty and researcher. To our Department of Oceanography faculty for their enthusiasm and their participation in the search and awards committees and the day-to-day -day advising and teaching of our Uihiro Graduate Student Fellows. 
to our graduate students, many of whom are Uihiro Fellows, for their scientific curiosity that drives us all. And to our staff and creative outreach director for their creativity and dedication. What the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education has done has been to create a community of very talented individuals responsive to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals who are working together to solve some of our world's most pressing problems. Thank you for believing in us, supporting, and inspiring us. Our next speaker will be Dr. Noboro Moriyama, the Senior Managing Director of the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am extremely happy to introduce Mr. Uihiro's patronage to UH. This wonderful event has occurred by a casual dialogue between President Lassner of UH and Chairman Tetsuji Uehiro of the Uehiro Foundation on Ethics and Education. The foundation began to support the UH with its major beneficiaries in the Department of Philosophy and College of Art Humanities in 2005. We have been well known as a patron for Uehiro Academy for Philosophy and Ethics in, in Education, of which main goal is enhancement of P4C. East and West Philosophers Conference has been sponsored by us in the past three hostings. On April 20th last year, Mr. Uehiro and President Lassner met for the first time at Harekrani Hotel in Honolulu. President Lassana asked Mr. Uehiro if he was interested in supporting research of natural science, such as oceanography or autonomy, astronomy. Mr. Uehiro immediately replied that he would support whatever field it, if it could continue to contribute to human happiness. It was like a question and answer by two very senior Zen priests. Negotiation between I and Professor McNamas began in June. As a layman in oceanography, I frankly asked Margaret what she wished us to do. To my great surprise, she had made a long-term strategic planning for her department. I asked her to let me read it. With a deep understanding of Mr. Uehiro and President Lassner, we came to agree to set up the Uehiro Center for Advancement of Oceanography with our long-term donation pledge. Mr. Uehiro had, had keen interest in SDGs in the past years. UH has turned out to be an ideal, ideal partner to make it happen with its academic strengths in its oceanography. Further to the donation for oceanography, Mr. Uehiro was very quick to determine new donation for the generation of Maui's education. While the fire attacked Lahaina on August 8th, Mr. Uehiro wasted no time to request me to send a message of deep sympathy to President Lassner. I was also suggested to get in touch with Tim, Vice President, to ask him what we can do for Maui. Each of us, while with great passion, discussed how we could encourage people of Maui under such a disastrous situation. September 1st of this year fell on the 100th anniversary of the Great Kanto earthquake, which killed more than 
100,000 people in and around Tokyo. It was remembered that the United States donated $12 million to devastate Tokyo and its citizens. On this day, Mr. Uehiro suggested me to inform President Lasuna of our strong will to make further donation for UH project for regeneration of Maui. We have made contract with UH both for oceanography and Maui recovery project with the condition that the amount of donation is not to be disclosed to both societies. In every society, it is often said that money talks, but Mr. Uehiro has inherited his ancestors' ethical attitude, such as modesty and integrity, which should not be valued by amount of money. In Japan, there is an old saying that even one cent donation is very precious. We wish UH and its communities to be activated and enhanced by our humble donation in the field of ethics, philosophy, oceanography, and the degeneration of Maui. Let's move forward together with our united strength. Thank you very much. Speaker is Dr. David Carl, a Center Advisory Council member, and the Victor and Peggy Branstrom Pavel, Professor of Microbial Oceanography. Aloha, Aloha. and welcome to Science Friday. Today we celebrate a historic event in the long and rich history of the Department of Oceanography. It is truly a magnificent day in Manoa. I am a member of the Advisory Council, as Margaret has already mentioned, but I also happen to be the longest serving faculty member in the Department of Oceanography. 45 years, nine months, eight days, but who's counting? <laughs> I should say that that pales by the length of time that President Lassner has been at this university <laughs> and several other scholars associated with different departments. I have sometimes been called, affectionately or not, the old man in the sea. Over my long career at UH, I have spent most of my time on topics related to sustainable goal number 14, life below water. And in my particular case, having completed 23 expeditions to Antarctica, I guess it might be more appropriate to say life below salt water and salt water ice. Over my long career at the University of Hawaii in the Department of Oceanography, I have become somewhat of a closet historian, especially with regard to the major successes that we have enjoyed over the 60-year history of our department. The creation of the department came at a time of rapid growth in the field of oceanography, both nationally and internationally, culminating with a major presidential level report termed Our Nation and the Sea, the so-called Stratton Commission Report of 1969. This led to major advances in ocean sciences here at UH and elsewhere, but at UH under the skilled leadership of Robert Hyatt. The second major waypoint was the creation in 1988 of the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, SOAST, under the effective leadership of Lorenz Megard, then chairman of the Department of Oceanography, and our University of Hawaii President Albert Simone. 
Today marks the third major waypoint, the establishment of the O'Hara Center for the Advancement of Oceanography under the leadership of Professor Margaret McManus, her advisory team, and the inaugural faculty and students. This was only made possible through the vision, advice, and generous support of the Uehiro Foundation for Education and Ethics. Like the other two major waypoints in our 60-year history, the creation of the Uehiro Center will likely set us off on a, an exciting new course for the department. The field of oceanography is an inherently interdisciplinary endeavor that is global in scope. The creation of the new center will embrace these features and will support oceanography sans frontier, that is science and research and education without borders. UH is fully capable and prepared to become a global place of learning. We need more scientists in a technologically complex world and a greater public understanding of science. The establishment of the Uehiro Center for the Advancement of Oceanography will help to ensure that ocean science is better understood and better modeled to help protect future ocean states for the shared benefit of all humanity. Our efforts in the new center will also help us establish more informed public policy and more impactful decision making among voters and lawmakers. We expect that the new opportunities within the center, especially with the UN Sustainable Development Goals as our core mission, will propel us into the top three academic programs in the world, possibly even to number one. Finally, I am uh, personally elated that the two major components of the center's mission are quality education and ethics. I look forward to contributing to the development of a new graduate course in ocean ethics that will include topics such as human rights, environmental justice, ethical government, uh, the ethical governance of the new blue economy, including marine carbon dioxide removal and climate engineering to address climate change. These are contemporary topics currently under discussion this week at COP28 in Dubai. Today we celebrate an historic event in the long and rich history of the Department of Oceanography. It is truly a magnificent day in Manoa. Thank you. speaker is President David Lassner, President of the University of Hawaii. Um, mahalo, Margaret, and um, uh, Mr. Uihiro, Mrs. Uihiro, um, Navoro, it is so good to see you here today. Um, we've been planning this day for months. Um, I think I'd like to share a little bit of the story of, of why we're all here from the other side of the conversation that uh, Naburo has shared with you. Um, the Ur Hero Foundation on Ethics and Education it has been really a cornerstone of the work we do at this university uh, for many, many years. Um, and some of our highest quality scholarship and education has been supported by the foundation um, Naburo mentioned the East-West Center Philosophers Conference, uh, which is the highest quality philosophy conference in the world, bar none. Um, the support for the philosophy uh, uh, for children, the P4C program, um, has touched the lives of students throughout Hawaii uh, for decades now, and um, has been shared with others around the country and around the world as well and presented to our Board of Regents as an example of the transformative work we can do and the appreciation that we have for our philanthropic supporters. It's just um, a remarkable program um, and has been supported for years. 
is not a one-time gift. It's an investment in a program. Um, so when we had the conversation at the Hale Kulani, and uh, Mr. Uehiro expressed interest in willingness, really interest in supporting some of our best research. Um, so don't get all swelled heads, oceanographers, but I thought of you. <laughs> um, this truly is one of our great departments at the University of Hawaii, as it should be, um, given our location. Um, but it's also, um, it's also a discipline that is so essential to the future of our planet. Um, so I have not been to Antarctica 26 times, um, but I had the good fortune much more recently to sail on um, a few legs with the Hokulea during the Malamahonua voyage, um, caring for our planet. And it's my relationship, I think, um, not only with oceanographers, like my neighbors across the street, um, that helps me understand the importance of oceanography, uh, but also my engagements with the Polynesian Voyaging Society and the passion of that whole community for understanding the importance of the health of the ocean to the health of our planet and the health of the people of our planet and of course the alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it was a pretty easy, and as Naburo said, I was pretty fast to answer the question. Um, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. You know, the work that Margaret has done with all of you has been amazing um, to put together a compelling program, and I can't wait to see the work that gets done by the center um, over these next years to come. So, so we've been, you know, planning this day probably since summertime or so. We began to pick the dates for the visit and, and this event to really kick off the center. Um, and then um, the Maui wildfires occurred. So um, we hadn't even really blessed this gift when an incredibly gracious offer uh, was made to us. Um, Mr. Uehiro asked, how can we help? And it was an open-ended request. How can we help the university help with the regeneration on Maui? And we, we hadn't been thinking about it all that long. It was you know, a week or so after the fires, as I recall. And um, we, we came up with several ideas that we had been working on already, and we didn't really know how we were gonna fully fund them. Um, one is scholarships for the students, uh, particularly of Lahaina and of Maui, who um, right now see very little hope for themselves, for their lives ahead. And many of them, in fact, I heard from a colleague in the Department of Education um, just on Wednesday that um, the kids don't have hope, but those who see these scholarships in their future, that's what's making them go to college because they know they're gonna be able to make it through and go on the pathway to a better life. But even for those who are planning to go to college, um, they have so much need for those who lost their houses, their cars, their jobs, um, their earthly belongings, that there's also a portion of this gift that will just support their ability to continue to survive, to live, um, while they go to school and take their pathway on to a better life. And the third part of the gift is about the workforce. So you picture the jobs that were lost on Maui, um, lots of them and primarily in the hospitality sector, which won't be back for some time, certainly not in Lahaina. And then you think about the rebuilding that has to take place and the number of jobs that will be required to do the work that's gonna be so necessary on Maui. And if we don't figure out how to train those on Maui who are out of work um, to fill those jobs instead, then those, those workers will be displaced by people who come in from other places elsewhere in Hawaii or on the continent. And so there's a substantial piece of funding to support workforce development and retraining of individuals on Maui um, to fulfill the jobs that are gonna be so needed on Maui. So um, 
there we are, we shared the ideas and um, you know, the gracious support was just unbelievable. I, I just can't say enough about how excited and grateful we are and how excited and grateful I know the people of Maui are. And so uh, we have a little bit of a double celebration here today, um, unexpectedly, um, but we're so glad that um, the Uhiros could join us here, that Naboro could join us here today, and that all of you who are doing the work of this amazing uh, new center here in the department are able to join us here today also. So um, I think some of us will not be able to stay, nor would we necessarily understand the rest of the symposium. But um, I, I just want to assure you that it, it's a big deal um, for me, as I know it is for all of you. So um, mahalo, and um, please enjoy the um, events to occur um, after these remarks. Aloha. Thank you, President Lassner. I'm very pleased to introduce our new Uihiro faculty and researcher. Our next speaker is Dr. Hyode So, an Uihiro associate professor. everyone, thank you very much. Um, I'm <coughs> uh, extremely honored to be here, and I'm incredibly so, um, grateful for support from the foundation and also faculty from the University of uh, Hawaii Oceanography Department, as well as West. Um, so here, um, I'm here to ask to provide very high-level summary of my research, what I'd like to do as part of my um, tenure at the, at the, at the Weiru Center uh, Research Plan, so here am I. So this is the title of my talk, and this is high, really high level three pictures that summarize my work, that summarize my work in the past as well as the, the work that I'm going to be doing um, at, at UH. So the title is the Understanding the Impacts of the Ocean in Weather, Climate, and Offshore Wind Energy Research. It could be anything related to uh, ocean-based uh, renewable energy activity. So you can link, to, o link the ocean in, with um, sort of extreme weather events impact us in every aspect of life. Wildlife, wildfire is one of the examples. The parts that are living in the East Coast, you get these winter storms that impact us in, you know, in the heavy rain, heavy snow, and power outage, things like that. And they can relate to short-term climate events, as well as the, um, all those burgeoning effort to, to, meet, uh, to, to harness the uh, renewable energy in the ocean to uh, mitigate the climate change impact. So here in the three images here, on the left is the, um, may oceanographers will know this is Gulf Stream, so warm temperatures in the east coast of US. You see the same thing in the Grosjeu in the West Pacific. And you can see um, all those very strong fronts in the ocean, and there's uh, all those swirls of the, of the currents, that's called major scale eddies in the ocean. You can see in the whenever there's a Gulf Stream here happening, in the, there's uh, the rings that detach it, there are lots of spatial variability in the ocean lot of variability in the temperatures, the current, and uh, biogeochemical, uh, biogeochemical processes. And then in the middle, you see these winter storms, right? This is my favorite topic, storms that impact in the east coast of US, heavy rain, heavy snow, um, seemingly unrelated to tiny eddies in the ocean, right? But there are very strong evidence that emerging that these are linked process. In the, uh, in the ocean, major scale eddies in front, impact the intensi intensity and path of these storms in the winter at this time. That leads us to oceanographers to measure, monitor this activity in the ocean as it relates to uh, prediction of the, uh, uh, the uh, extratropical extra uh, cyclones event. On the right, we have uh, offshore wind turbines. And these are one of the few turbines out there in the US water. One of the, I think you see three here, three out of five turbines out there that are currently operating in the US water. And Initially, people put the turbine in the water, thinking the same thing might be happening in the onshore versus offshore setting. setting. But you can see there's a waves, ocean currents, and temperature, things like that. There are a lot of variability that impact the, what uh, we might uh, see at the, 
the wind at the hop height, hop height of the turbine here, about 330 meters. So this is a massive system that will dominate us in, term, in, in, in terms of coastal um, setting in the next five, 10 years, as I'll talk about more. So you can see these climate events, climate action, how we more accurately predict these events um, uh, through oceanographic understanding of this process related to climate action, as well as affordable and clean energy. How do we use this clean energy while minimizing the impact on the ocean, while promoting the co-use of the coastal ocean between this um, uh, other community like fishery and other, other, uh, other settings that, 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 that um, lie on, um, on coastal oceans. So these are the kind of very, very seemingly three random figures that are very strongly linked to, to, um, to, um, to in my research. And the core of that is, again, oceanic variability, impact on weather and, and the, uh, energy. So I'm here. Um, I'm currently with the Oceanographic Institution, but I'll be joining the Weiru Center and the Oceanography as of next summer. So I'll be very much looking forward to meeting you and then interacting with individual of you um, in coming year. So here is a very busy plot, but this is a, a very simple um, kind of illustration that shows the oceans is full of major scale eddies. You see this um, source of eddy. This is of course schematic, but of course it's a, um, it's a, it's physics is very much in there. Ocean eddies, um, about hundreds of kilometers in the length scale. So what you saw in the previous slide, this, this eddy is about hundreds of kilometers radio uh, uh, diameter. Once they occur, especially winter time in the high latitude, they generate a very large scale temperature normal in the ocean. The atmosphere care about that. And care about that because the length scale of eddies of hundreds of kilometers, and these eddies act on the atmospheric boundary layer of only about one or two kilometers. So atmospheric boundary layer perspective, these are very significant forcing. And they persist many, many months. Right? So they're very persistent forcing of the atmosphere. Temperature difference between ocean and atmosphere across the eddy can be very large. So temperature difference that you may, if, if you are the physical oceanographers, you know that temperature difference will lead to heat flux out of the ocean. So this ocean will heat, pump the heat out of the ocean into the atmosphere and storms take that energy and carry on to the cold water energy transport. So you see um, when this kind of warm air happens, boundary layer in the atmosphere very become very stabilized, uh, unstable because of the warm temperature co coming out of the ocean. So there are two hypothetical scenario of the wind profile. Cold water, wind profile is like this, but the warm water around this major scale eddy, uh, surface wind speed can increase because of the impact of the ocean temperature of the ocean major scale eddy. So there's a shift in the wind profile. And I show this profile over and over again throughout my presentation. That's because it related to, again, impact on the offshore wind energy. On the right plot is all um, so showing the map of the correlation between wind speed and as, uh, surface temperature. So you can see this wind warm water increased surface wind speed that can be shown in the global ocean where you need to calculate correlation between wind speed and SST that are spatially high pass filters. So you remove the large scale variability, you only retain the small scale feature, then you see the correlation between wind and SST is predominantly positive. So positive meaning again the higher wind speed over warm water. So that's consistent with this kind of schematic. And you can see where the correlation is high. You see the Gulf Stream where I live here right currently, Crocio, Equatorial Pacific, very large area of Southern Ocean. These are the area where ocean major scale variability determines the ocean heat transport, has a very strong spatial vari variability does at the surface, at atmospheric boundary layer, and storms care about those. So um, these are the, you may say this is boundary layer problem, but as actually this is related to short-term climate event. Um, so this is, bottom panel shows uh, all those green shading represent the intensity of the extra tropical cyclone. So again, I live here. We see storms all the time this time of year. So I really appreciate to, uh, to have an opening ceremony in December in Hawaii as we're getting away from these winter storms in the happening in the East Coast. Deep green means higher storm intensity. A and the contours are seas of temperature. Um, so you can see this in the atmospheric, uh, in atmospheric literature, this storm intensity are determined by two primary two factors. I hate to put this equation here, but one, one of the more important factor is the D theta dy. So that's a temperature gradient. So how the temperature gradient, how strong temperature gradient is, is actually directly impactful for the intensity of storm. And one of N, N is the stratification of the boundary layer. Warm water, again, is destabilized boundary layer. 
And you do this kind of condition are uh, uh, conditionally satisfied on this kind of area of Gold Stream and Crucial, where lots of major scale variability, injecting energy into the atmosphere, reduce the stability, increase the better cleanliness in, in the atmosphere, the, the energized storm. So these are the kind of a very, uh, the emerging understanding of how the ocean variability will impact the, uh, uh, our understanding of the how storms should behave in the current and future climate. But you can move on to offshore wind. This is a really the kind of my recent research that I'm fascinated by this research. And it's, it has to do with a very strong um, associated implication, right? Offshore wind, we have, I'm pretty sure most of you heard about it. You know, we, you know, we have the massive development of offshore wind in the East Coast right now. So this is a color, color map shows the wind speed at hop height. So again, about 130 meter height of the, from the surface. Deep red means that there's a higher wind speed happening in this area, and north is where we come from. This is the largest a uh, area of the wind resource, right? So we cannot not to afford to use this kind of resource to, to generate the electron, generate electricity, instead of using, continuously using the uh, fossil fuel, right? Federal government plan, climate action plan, is currently set by 2030, which is six years, five, seven years from now, we're going to have about 2.5, 2,500 turbines in the water. Currently we have five. So we, got a, we have a lot of turbines to be developed within the next five, six years. And we say that all those turbines will be developed in the northeast corner of the United States. So all this red area will be filled with 2,500 turbines in the next five years, um, if the plan is to hold. By 2050, U.S. government wants to generate 3,000 gigawatts of wind power, and that's about 250,000 turbines. So this is a momentous change in the way you use coastal ocean. You, our coastal water, not just Northeast, Gulf of Mexico, U.S. West Coast, will be filled with the wind turbines, right? So this is a, and we're gonna achieve this by while protecting biodiversity, so whales and fisheries and other things, uh, get, uh, ocean ecosystem, as well as uh, promoting ocean co-use. Again, there's other community that rely on coastal oceans. How do you achieve this balance while generating clean energy, right? This is a huge challenge for us. National Academy of Science has a two active committee on this topic. It's a very unusual, and that's because of this importance of uh, impact on fishery, whales, impact on um, 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 hydrodynamics as well. So you can see there are like wind turbines in the, in the Europe, there are lots of, wind, uh, uh, of your wind developments already happening. And you, of course, you can think about these whales and you know, you know, uh, things, sea mammals and uh, uh, wildlife conservation is an acute uh, concern to all those wind, active, wind energy industry as well as the general community. I see there are two main issues as oceanographers to think about when you, when you hear about the wind and offshore wind energy is that there's a wind production and prediction is really important, but we don't have any observation at this point to actually constrain the numerical model to say next five months, ne next five minutes, next one hour, next six hour period, how much wind energy we can potentially harness in the ocean, in the water. We don't have the knowledge, we don't have observation. And numerical models are poorly, poorly constrained in that sense. So this is something that oceanographers, air interaction people can actually actively contribute to understanding of the what determines the wind at that height, right? And then there is a whole suite of issues like, again, marine hydro hydrodynamics, gas exchanges of carbon and oxygen and nutrients, ecosystem fisheries and wildlife preservation. All those things are very important. Also, wind turbines are represent the extremely strong forcing of the ocean. And I talked about it in the following slides. So here is again, role of the ocean or impact on the ocean is something that we don't really have good understanding. And this is something I like to study more uh, at, at UH Hawaii. So let's demonstrate this issue. Here is the wind turbine here. What turbine does is that this is not just stick, sticking out of the ocean. It has a really large the, the blaze is about 200 meter diameter. It's a huge system, and we're gonna have again thousands of system out there. When turbine spins, when wind blows, it takes up the kinetic energy from the wind, right, and generate the energy. And th because of that, atmosphere receives uh, is left with less winds, less kinetic energy, right? And okay, wind is the main major driver of the ocean. It's kinetic energy is injected into the ocean, drive the ocean circulation. In the oceanic perspective, it it receives less wind. 
right? And again, it is, it, one or two turbines won't make much difference, but if you scaled up to thousands of turbines, this could be potentially a very important issue. So here's again wind profile diagram here. Without wind farm, there's a hypothetical wind profiles here. Sorry, I should put here. But then when your wind farm is built, the real climatology will be that the wind speed at that site will be lower because turbine will take up the energy. How much is that? That's the acute question. We don't really understand. And there are a lot of modeling study out there trying to understand how much of the wind speed reduction are we talking about at that uh, certain depends on the scenario of the offshore wind development. So what I did is a numerical model. I put, represent this process in the numerical model, and there is a way to do it. I'd be happy to talk about it. And then compared with another simulation where those effect, wind turbines are not built. So one run with the ocean turbine, or turbine is built, another run without turbine. And you can compare the wind speed. And this is what you see in the movie here. It's, um, blue means a wind speed reduction. We call wind speed deficit because the turbine takes up the energy. And you can see color scale goes plus minus four meter per second and predominantly blue, right? So the wind is highly changing in nature, of course. Whenever wind blows, it's a turbine takes up the wind kinetic energy with reduce the wind speed behind that turbine area, uh, the wind farm area. This is essentially what you're seeing right now. But this is stringent synaptic math, right? If you Think about long-term um, perspective. How much of the energy reduction are we talking? How much wind reduction are we talking about? And this is what is shown in the bottom panel. Two maps comparing the wind speed at 338 meters. So that's about again turbine height. Um, one is the as is clim as is current climatology right now. This is where we live in. Uh, this is um, Usoris right here. This is Martha Vineyard. This is Nantucket Island. This is a uh, current wind lease area. If you develop all the turbine here, about 800 turbines here, if you in the current climatology, wind speed is like this, about uh, nine meter per second in the summer time. If you develop the turbine, you'll be looking like this. And depends on who you ask. This is um, this is potentially very important map that you can talk about. This is going to be our climatology in five years from now, for example. If you are a coastal oceanographer who care about the wind circulation in this region, wind is extremely important. And this, you have to deal with this kind of wind pattern as opposed to this wind pattern five to 10 years from now. And I think this is a really important issue. This is a wind speed difference between these two. So you can see about 20, 30% of wind speed is actually has slowed down because the turbine takes up that much energy. So, but again, this, has, this kind of study has been done by all the uh, onshore case, like land, uh, so turbine over land, where ocean temperature doesn't change, ocean doesn't, you know, land doesn't change, right, because of turbine, right? So this is a really the new area of uh, um, kind of a problem where um, when you build a turbine of the water, what happens to ocean given the wind speed reduction? And as oceanographers, this is a very obvious problem. I mean, you have obvious answer, actually. If, if you reduce the wind speed, what do you think will happen in the ocean? The current will slow down. Temperature will go up. That's the, basically what is happening. So here, this is a surface stress. So this is actually momentum flux from the atmosphere to the ocean um, without turbine. And this is difference between two cases, again, with turbine, without turbine. And like you saw from the wind pattern, stress, wind stress has reduced quite a bit especially around the turbine area. So again, oceanographers care about the stress of the wind because this is what drives the ocean circulation and stress will reduce, current will slow down. What happened to sea sub temperature? Sea sub temperature will generally um, anomalously warm. So in this case, the ocean is mixed because the wind is blowing, but wind is weaker, so ocean will, uh, will cool less basically. So if you take the difference period, you will see the anomalous warming of the ocean in the presence of turbine. We didn't have this kind of understanding until now. I think this is my, uh, my understanding. This is the very first plot, in, uh, the understanding, first glimpse of the ocean response to offshore wind energy. And you can do this by using the uh, coupling model. So there is ocean, atmosphere, wave, uh, fully coupled system. Ocean temperature, um, in this case, about half degree less cooling or anomalous warming. This is what we are talking about. So again, the, again, the onshore turbine, the turbine that has been built over land, doesn't consider ocean temperature change, uh, the land surface temperature, because land surface does not change because of turbine. And the traditional knowledge up to now is a turbine doesn't change ocean temperature. We didn't know about that, right? So these are the kind of a sort of 
traditional understanding of the, how the turbine will interact with the surface. But now we have understanding surface temperature will anomalously cool, uh, uh, less cooled or anomalously warmer, right? So in this case, um, black is again wind without turbine, uh, wind uh, without the wind farm, and the blue is a wind, with, wind without wind farm but without SST warming. But because SST warming or SST cools less, there's a there's an impact on the boundary of winds as I talked about in the very first slide. Warm eddy, warm ocean temperature, destabilized boundary layer, increase the surface winds. This is what is happening from blue, as we understand currently, the winds, wind profile will shift to the right in the middle somewhere because of this is what ocean does to the atmosphere in response to wind forcing. So can we show this? Can we show this in terms of wind stress or even hop high wind? If it is true, then that's huge. Um, uh, I think it's very important because energy production deficit estimate is extremely important thing. And actually, in predicting wind at hop height is you know, developer's interest, right? Grid operator's interest, right? And we don't really understand yet how this SST of anomaly of this size will impact hop height. But I can tell you is that it actually affects the wind stress quite a bit. So this is, you can think of this kind of SST anomaly as about 150 kilometer major scale eddy, right? About half degree warming. And in response to this, if you import this kind of SST warming, you get the wind stress about 20, 30% increase um, uh, respect to the stress deficit that we saw before. So actually, if you have an interactive ocean, ocean will do a little bit of favor to us and increase the wind speed, mitigate the stress deficit that we saw before, right? So all those estimates we might have in the, in the literature out there about potential impact of wind turbine on the wind stress, um, things like that might have been a little bit exaggerated in the sense that ocean actually does mitigate a little bit, right? So ocean turbine will reduce the wind speed, but in re response to that, SST warms in the ocean, and the warming of the ocean will actually give back a little bit of momentum into the atmosphere. So having this kind of small negative, past sort of depends how you define sign, small feedback effect could be potentially very important for, again, energy production perspective as well as the oceanography setting, right? Again, wind stress is extremely important. Wind stress may not be actually this much changing, actually, right? Because there's deficit uh, offset from coming from the ocean, coupling with the atmosphere. So again, here's a summary. Um, you see a two large scale thread of my research that I'd like to continue at, at the UH again. Storm track in the extra track cyclones are strongly, strongly maintained by major scale variability in the ocean, small scale assessed variability. Um, <clears throat> winter storms or many other million dollar uh, disaster event, fire, wildfire is one of the example, drought, heat wave, everything, are strongly, strongly influenced by their interaction with the ocean. And this is, is a you know, well-known uh, scientific evidence out there. Question is uh, how do we use this physics to, um, to improve the predictability of this extreme event? This is something that I'm very passionate about. And once you know this kind of physics kind of process and understanding of it, you can apply it to ocean response to wind farm, right? And then you can understand the energy perspective as well as the, um, um, the mitig mitigating oceanic impact in terms of hydrodynamics and marine ecosystem, fishery, things like that. So this is something, again, I'm very interested in continuing. And I really like to thank Weyro Foundation for supporting my position at UH. And I'll be very much looking forward to working with every single one of you. Thank you. Nicholas? So you mentioned the impact of the wind farm on the ocean system temperature and other oceans. What about the impact of the wind farm on the atmospheric synoptic system? Atmospheric synoptic system. Synoptic system, yeah. That's the I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I, I don't know either. I think um it will change winds. That's the only way, right? It doesn't, you know, I mean, for now, we don't know the turbine in the ocean. You don't have a ocean wave effect. Only, only thing we know about the turbine will take up the energy, reduce the wind speed locally, a some, some little bit on downstream too, and the ocean will adjust to that. And that's what I show. It's like one dimensional, simple, instantaneous response. How does it impact the synaptic system? I don't know.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Sachiko Yoshida, the Ui Hiro Associate Researcher. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sachiko Yoshida. I am from Seoul Oceanographic Institution, and my talk is about, as you can see the, the, from the title, I'm going to talk about the, the Fukushima derived radionuclide um, and spread in the North Pacific Ocean, looking at the observational data as well as the uh, surface drifter trajectory data. So the, um, the figure I'm showing here is the dri dr surface drifter trajectory deployed, the drifters de deployed about two months after the accident of the Fukushima. Um, and then color is showing the time, so color coded with the time every two months. Um, as you can see, the trajectory is strongly influenced by this strong jet uh, near Japan and uh, eddy activities in this region. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna introduce first um, about observation, the water sample getting from uh, coastal to the offshore, and as well as using the, the interpretation using the surface drifter data, data set. So um, before yeah, getting into my talk, I want to express my uh, acknowledgement to uh, my colleagues at Hui, Alison, Irina, and Steve Jane, Susan, and Ken Bessler and his lab group is always help us to analyze the, the samples. So um, for the, as an introduction, I wanna uh, start talking about um, North Pacific um, surface circulation. So the schematic, uh, this is a schematic view. Um, so the, in the North Pacific, as you all know that um, there is a subtropical gyre, the large gyre, wind driven gyre, uh, showing the red here and then subpolar gyre. So the subtropical gyre, the water from the south, warm and salty water is brought into um, in this uh, tropical to uh, subtropical um, area by cruise shield, western boundary current along, flowing along Japan and it meets with the uh, Oyashio water which is uh, cold and uh, nutrient rich upwelled water and it's actually mixed off, off Japan and um, uh, just um, in the mix and they're, they're the area that um, the accident happened and they injected the radionuclide into the ocean is um, oceanographically very dynamic area. And then as we mix and then uh, move to the transported to the eastward and slows down and the, it, as it propagates, uh, close to getting close to the west coast, U.S. west coast is uh, bifurcates to the north and south. Um, yeah, I should use this one. And the, yeah, the branch to the north is the become, becoming Alaska uh, current into the Alaska, uh, Gulf of Alaska, and the southern uh, part is going along the, the coast um, as a California counter current. So, and then it comes back as a North Equatorial Current. And so this is the two big um, cells uh, in the North Pacific. And I want to highlight this line. This is a gold shape P16 line. I'm gonna use this um, line as a kind of reference uh, the, the, in my presentation. We have a water sample in two, two years, in past 10 years, and showing a very nice map um, about the cesium, the radionuclide tracer distribution. And so, yeah, the rest of my presentation content, um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the radionuclide that I'm using uh, in this talk. And then uh, I show, I'm gonna show how the water gets samples and how the distribution looks like uh, from 2011 to 18. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, the drifter data and show the probability map to see the uh, robust view of the spread in the North Pacific. So, okay, so I'm here showing a um, bunch of pictures um, for, from the, when we go out to get the water. 
So the, I should uh, have to say the very initial survey the, for the Fukushima water sampling is uh, we used the KOK from Hawaii. Uh, we went out on the site 2011, uh, June. So this is the picture on the top. Um, this is the, from KOK, this is Rosette. And the picture in the middle, so this, for the cesium sampling, we simply just fill out this 20 liter cubic air from directly from here, this Niskin bottle. We sometimes get the beach sample, um, and most of the time, uh, we get the biological sample as well. So these, uh, we, we have a biology group and then geochemist in the, the cruise, and we sh often ship, and also we get the sediment uh, sampling as well. So yeah, after we fill up this 20 liter um, cube container, we ship to the Ken Bessler's lab, and then he count, he analyzed the data for us. And this picture on the bottom is showing the rosette. This is one of the Japanese research crews I uh, participated to get the sample. Yeah, behind, we get really close um, to the, this is 2013 picture, to the reactor. This is the Fukushima uh, power plant. So, and next, um, so there are a few things, there are a few things that I have to um, talk about this um, radionuclide. So the cesium is soluble, so it exists in the desorbed form. This, it has no scent or no color, it's desorbed in the form, so that's why we think it's an excellent tracer. It moves with the water mass in the ocean. And it has about 30 years, the radionuclide that I, I, I use is the 137, it's about 30 years um, half-life. Half and so once it's uh, deposited into the ocean, it stays in the ocean years and decades and calm. It's just um, decays very slow. And this is the time series of the decay, the cesium-137 decay, starting from 1960. Um, this sample was collected, most of the sampling is from the, um, the Western Pacific, shown here, the red dot. And uh, so the cesium-137 coexists pre-exist pre before 2000. So this time series and just before the accident happened, but as you can see, it starts at around 50 per cubic meter and then it's declining the trend uh, due to the decay. And then by the time when the accident happened, the ocean has about one to 1.5 per cubic meter in the Pacific Ocean, the surface water. But it's not equally distributed, of course. There is a subduction and mixing. All those uh, physical process um, is uh, happening in this area. And many researchers joined. This is a uh, Aoyama L2008 paper, but not only this paper is saying like there is um, elevated um, activity, like cores in the subsurface as well. So these, um, not e like a uniform, but it's about one to 1.5 per cubic meter uh, pre-exists before the accident. And, uh, okay, next slide. So these are the locations that we collect the sample. I'm only showing the surface sampling uh, location. Color is the concentration between zero to five. And as I said, uh, it has about one to 1.5, which is shown in this blue color, pre-exists in the ocean before the accident. So I want to highlight this yellow crowd. You can see is moving eastward as time goes. And 2013, this is uh, when the P2, Goshi P2 line, we got the sample from uh, the transect at the 30 nodes. And this um, head, head of this signal is about 160 west. And then 2014, there's uh, no transect, but you see the um, elevated value in the Gulf of Alaska. And 15 and 18, we have uh, two nice transect uh, sampling uh, at the same uh, location. So 2050, go, go ship P16 conducted, and you see between 30 to 50 is about five per cubic meter. And there's no observation between, between 16 and 17. And then 18, um, it has decreased quite a bit. It's almost back to the background level. So as you can see, you know, 
we have observation, but we cannot really tell um, anything about what's um, going between these ears and then the, get the spread, like a robust basin scale picture of the, these signals. So I, that's why we use this uh, surface drifter trajectory data. So as you, many of you know, the surface drifter looks like this. It has a floating buoy at the surface and um, the drogue at the 50 meter is connected. And it's communicate with the satellite every 10 days, um, sending the location and temperature. There's a temperature measurement. And you can download data from AOML, AOML website. And in the North Pacific, it's about 7,500 drifters um, since two, 1979. So it has a, a quite, a, quite a bit of um, number of drifter. And the middle panel show, this is a number of the trajectory data in uh, half degree beam. Yeah, there are less in the tropic and high latitude, but it has a pretty good coverage in that uh, subtropic um, region. And uh, what else? So the right side is, the, this is the mean velocity calculated from the, the drifter data. And it has a um, um, pretty good agreement with other data set. So using this, I just want to skip this one. Um, how do you get the, the robust picture? Robust picture of the spread. Um, we calculate the probability using this, this trajectory uh, data set. So what, how do I do it? Is you set a small source area which I did it at along this um, P16 line. For example, I said um, this is the, the source shown in the red uh, with some latitudinal window, which is I, I said I think five degree, like between 40 to 45 or something. And then um, track the trajectory, uh, drifters passing here, to, I mean the trajectory passing in this source area and calculate uh, probability based on this equation is very simple. Um, so it's Nij is the number of the successful trajectory visiting in any of the domain divided by the number, total number of the trajectory. So the problem of, problem of this is we don't have much trajectory if we only apply this. This is the view, and you see this whole white area. There is no trajectory visiting in this region. So um, to tackle that issue, we um, apply this uh, two this or higher uh, order iteration method. I'm not going to talk about the detail, but if you are interested in the Repina et al. 2014 and 16 describe um, the details. So we basically um, run the higher iteration using the uh, other trajectory data, the rest, the unused trajectory data. And this is how it looks like after 10th iteration. So you see pretty much this whole domain is covered, even though this is a gray, is a 1% of the probability. So it's a very small um, possibility to visit in this area, but you still get the picture of um, this whole uh, regions. So I want to um, show the, some of the results that set um, at the source at this P16 line. And we can also run this experiment t forward and backward both. So this is the one of the result that I'm going to show. Uh, so this is, a, the, again, the observation. And then you see this elevated uh, cesium between 30 to 50, and then wondering where it possibly comes from. So we run the backward, um, this, uh, the method, and then set the source window um, at each latitude. And this is five degree from 30 to 35, 35 to 40, and 40 to 45. And you can see the clear, um, kind of connection, the signal coming from the West Pacific. And also, you can see the south of 30 
is not really connected. You don't see any clear connection, but um, this is actually a, when you forward um, the, ex the run the forward experiment, you see this uh, circulation gyre right across uh, this P16 line um, in two years. So yeah, this provides a time, associated time map as well as shown. So this is the time on the showing top. The yellow is two years. So this is showing, yeah, from Western, of Japan, Western Pacific, to get to the 152 line, it takes about two years. And if you go higher latitude, this is how it looks like. Um, this is a source 45 to 50 and 50 to 55. You see the less, um, there is not clear connection, um, but when the source is set 40 to 45, it's actually bifurcates to the northward and going to the um, Alaska, Gulf of Alaska. So um, yeah, this is a summary slide. And we, I want to emphasize um, the importance of the continuous monitoring. Uh, this takes a lot of effort um, to get the sample, but it's really important to uh, monitor and um, assess the long-term impact in the ocean. And from my talk, yes, 152 P60 P line, um, you see the, the connection uh, of the the signal, the tracers coming from the uh, off Japan area, and it could be related to the direct di discharge with a time scale of two to three years. And it's um, observed um, three years later, 2015 and 18, uh, and then you see the elevation of the southern latitude um, in the between 20 to 30 in 2018, 18, just because of the gyre across um, the, to that area that was observed. And uh, the signal in the Alaskan gyre is likely derived from uh, atmospheric deposition uh, because we didn't see it's coming from uh, the higher probability didn't show up in, from the Western Pacific. And one last thing I want to talk about is, um, so this is a um, recently funded project from Sea Grant um, investigating the wastewater from the Peregrine Power, Power Plant Station, which is located here. Uh, this is Boston. So this is the southeast part of the Boston. And this is actually Cape Cod Bay. And it was whole is located here. Um, so there is an increased um, concern, public concern about the safety and also the impact on the uh, fishery industry and tourism because just because it, this is enclosed and we don't know how long um, the water stays in circulation pattern. So we start uh, investigating, putting some time um, working with a student uh, using a high resolution um, model output, but this could be, so this um, multi-iteration method that I showed today using the surface drifter data could be applicable and we can um, it can be useful to this kind of regional research to the larger scale, spatial scale research to see not only the, the tracer um, ex experiment or, but more like a ocean pollution um, or other chemical tracer in the, in the area. So that could be linked to this, uh, the UN is the one of the goal um, under 14, category 14, the life under the uh, ocean water, life under the water um, category. So that, that's, that's all. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, that's a good question. So in my talk, I'll only talk about the surface observation result and surface processes, yeah. But ocean is not 2D. There is, uh, especially in this area, there's a lot of strong mixing and model water formation. 
there are a lot of uh, subsurface uh, signals also. And then we see um, it's actually um, transported to the, um, to the, the, to the east, eastern basin extended at certain density layers. So yeah, that, uh, that was also, yeah, we studied about it. I didn't talk about it today, but yes, that's important, yes. Our next speaker is Dr. Anissa Silviger, an Uihiro Associate Professor. Awesome. Thank you all so much for coming here today and for inviting me to join this incredible center and incredible department. This feels very much like a homecoming to me. I uh, got my PhD here at the University of Hawaii and so now getting to come back as faculty is very much a dream. And so I am an ecological oceanographer and you just saw two incredible talks on large scale oceanographic um, issues and I work on the other end of the spectrum studying ecological and oceanographic processes on the order of kilometers, meters, to even centimeters. Um, but before I get into the research program that I have been developing and that I'm excited to continue here in Hawaii, I was hoping you would indulge me for a minute and allow me to talk story and tell you a little bit about who I am as a person and how I became motivated to do this type of ecological oceanography related to sustainability. So I grew up in South Florida um, in a town relatively close to the ocean and so I was very lucky to get to experience coastal ecosystems from a very young age. In fact, I started scuba diving basically before I could even walk and honestly not much has changed today. And growing up in South Florida in the 80s and the 90s, I experienced firsthand a lot of different conservation issues that motivated me. So we saw both the decline and also the recovery of many sea turtle species. We saw changes to our manatees, we saw changes to mangrove systems, and of course the changing coral reef ecosystem. And watching the changing coral reef ecosystem firsthand um, was incredibly motivational to me. And in one particular story, um, my mom over here, <laughs> who was an avid scuba diver um, before I was born, um, also grew up in Miami and had been basically out of the water for about 20 to 30 years. And when I was a master's student working in the Florida Keys, I had the opportunity to bring her to one of my field sites and take her snorkeling um, at a place that I thought was just absolutely beautiful. And we got into the water, she comes up to the surface and she was devastated and I didn't understand. I was like, look at this beautiful place. And I realized that the experiences that my mom had growing up in South Florida in the Florida Keys were substantially different than my first experiences. So this was the first time that I really saw this shifting baseline idea um, and the loss of stability for natural ecosystem function and changing human interactions. So this was very motivational to be to become a scientist that studies global change ecology in our coastal ecosystems. And so I conduct um, ethical place-based oceanographic research. Um, I work together to empower students and community. And as an educator, I, I am also incredibly passionate about hands-on education. And my uh, research and educational program, for the most part, take place in coastal ecosystems. And so one of the reasons why I love coastal ecosystems so much is because they are the gateway to the ocean. So you are experiencing the ocean for the most part through these types of coastal ecosystems. And so I work in two major systems. We work in the rocky inner tidal in coastal California and in Oregon. Um, and I also, of course, work in coral reef ecosystems like here in Hawaii and I also spend a lot of time in French Polynesia and other places around the world. And coastal ecosystems are incredibly important also because they contribute disproportionately to fisheries catch. They can act as sequesters for CO2, natural sequesters for CO2, and of course are incredibly important to our economy both through fisheries and through tourism. And I ask many different questions in these coastal ecosystems. Two that I'm working on a lot are trying to understand how do land-sea connections and climate change affect ecosystem metabolism, and how do marine organisms both drive and respond to changes in their local environment. 
And one of the ways that we can think of ecosystem metabolism is we can think of it as the pulse of the ocean, so the heartbeat of the ocean. And just by measuring some changes in chemistry, we can understand how fast organisms are breathing, how fast they're photosynthesizing, how fast they're growing and calcifying. And so that is a big part of the research program that I have um, been conducting and I'm excited to continue to conduct here in Hawaii. And one of the land-sea connections that I've spent a lot of time thinking about recently is submarine groundwater discharge. And a submarine groundwater discharge is the flow of any water. It can be fresh, marine, or a composite of both. And it moves from the land through the marginal seabed and into the coastal oceans. And it can have high, really high levels of nutrients, low pH, and it can also have high levels of total alkalinity which lots of students here, and especially also in the UA Here Center, are, are looking at how that could act as a natural buffer for ocean acidification. And this groundwater uh, fluxes are found all over the world, as you can see in this map. And these blue colors show how incredibly important they are to tropical e ecosystems. And in particular, they're also even more important to high volcanic tropical islands, like here in Hawaii. And so this image over here shows a picture of one of our field sites. Um, where it looks like a bad picture, but it's not. This blurriness is actually fresh water that's coming up through cracks in the ground and is mixing with the nearby seawater. And for the last several years, I've mostly been working in areas that are like snorkelable. You're walking along the beach. You might feel something cold coming under your feet, and that's actually fresh water that's coming up. But in fact, by collaborating with um, local communities in Tahiti, we've been discovering even more um, ecosystems that have these huge pulses of groundwater coming up onto the reef. So this is a video. This fuzziness is showing this like fire hose of fresh water flooding this coral reef at about 25 feet. And you can see that healthy corals are just sitting there soaking in fresh water. So there's so much more to learn about this system and the importance to coral reefs. So we have many different scientific discoveries looking at the impacts of local and global stressors from organism to ecosystem scale. And so some of our discoveries include uh, looking at the effects of ocean acidification or nutrient pollution on how organisms respond to temperature. And so we've shown that both ocean acidification and nutrients affect these levels of thermal performance, highlighting that local and global interactions are incredibly important. We've also been working here in Hawaii to try to better understand uh, the bioerosion or natural breakdown of our coral reefs. And in fact, we showed that bioerosion rates from worms and sponges and bivalves are actually more sensitive to ocean acidification than the growth of corals themselves. So we discovered that the, the balance between both reef accretion, which is the overall growth of reefs, and reef erosion, understanding both of those is necessary for predicting reef persistence. We've also been working a lot on biophysical feedback loops, trying to understand how organisms are continuously both driving and responding to changes in their environment. So these organisms are photosynthesizing and respiring, and they are changing the CO2 and oxygen environment around them, which of course then changes the pH environment, and that pH affects other biological processes like calcification or the net growth of calcifiers and dissolution or the breakdown. So we discovered that understanding biophysical feedbacks is needed to predict ecosystem metabolism. In that same vein, we've also been looking a lot at how foundation species um, not only directly affect ecosystems through changing habitat, but also can indirectly affect the metabolism of, of these ecosystems by changing the thermal and biogeochemical environment. So we've shown that loss of foundation species from events like heat waves through seagrasses and mussels in these examples, um, removing these will lead to both direct and indirect effects on ecosystem metabolism. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight some of our mar more recent work on submarine groundwater discharge, where we've created models to better understand how the nutrients from groundwater is actually creating biogeochemical cascades on coral reefs. So this added nutrients can augment the production of organisms like algae and coral. That changing production is going to change the inorganic carbon pool, so like CO2 and pH. That changing inorganic carbon pool is then going to change community calcification of things like corals and calcifying algae. And together, all that's going to affect the organic carbon flux. And so we've discovered that submarine groundwater discharge may be more important to re refunctioning than previously thought. 
And all of this research together, our key underpinnings of all of these discoveries are within data science, data transparency, and reproducibility to enable knowledge equity. So I am incredibly passionate, passionate about data science and transparency in data science. So our science is not just conducted in a vacuum. In order for us to share our science, we have to be good educators, collaborators, work with outreach. So that's also a very important part of my research program. And so some examples of outreach and collaboration that we've been working on are, we have been working with a community organization in the island of Mo'orea called Reva Atea to conduct K through eight um, research right at our field site. So these are students that are collecting chemistry in middle school um, right at our freshwater seeps. We also work with Tepua Atatia um, to create internships for students from the University of French Polynesia where we create a cultural exchange and we learn an incredible amount of traditional knowledge from these students and then we create internship opportunities to bring these students out into the field and into the lab with us. I'm also working together with community organizations that are focused on place-based conservation. So this is a picture actually from, I think, three or four weeks ago, um, where we were working with Tamar UT Ponte de Pesher in Tahiti, which is a coral restoration organization in Tahiti, and we're, we're helping them with water quality management and to try to help them better understand the effects of groundwater on coral growth at their research sites. And lastly, I also do an incredible amount of public awareness through art and film, so that in a, in a way that we can share our science and knowledge, not only through um, our brain, but also through our hearts. So working with these artists and these filmmakers, we create creative ways to share the effects of climate change and understand um, changing coral reef ecosystems. And so continuing here at the UE Hero um, Center, I'm excited to bring all of these collaborations, to bring all of these research ideas to the center, and of course, continue to conduct um, research on solutions to major challenges in oceanography that could impact policy. So just a couple of examples include thinking about submarine groundwater discharge as a natural test bed for ocean alkalinity experiments, and using the biogeochemical cascade framework to connect ecosystem ecology to oceanography and to humans and society. And I'm also excited to continue to champion our cross-collaborative opportunities that are inclusive across all different oceanographic disciplines. So including working with colleagues to create a data science center of excellence that accentuates indigenous data sovereignty, to work um, with colleagues in instilling a focus on oceanography with a sense of place, and to help to facilitate a seat at the table with national and international political leaders on ocean and climate action. So all of this work has been done with a ton of collaborators, some who are even in this room here today. Um, and so I'd like to thank all of my incredible collaborators, our funding, um, of course, the UE Hero Foundation on Ethics and Education, and also very importantly to me, my graduate students and technicians who have constantly lifted me up year after year after year. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I've been collaborating with artists for a long period of time, and I actually have a NSF career grant where that's a continuing part of um, our outreach and educational program, and I, they're very excited that I'm coming to Hawaii um, to continue to work on, on those projects together. portion of our program is for the Uihiro Graduate Student Fellows who's, who have been with us for a year. We're going to start with Kate Polloy. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Kate Polloy, uh, Uihiro Graduate Student Fellow and I work with Dr. Brian Powell. Um, my research uses primarily numerical models, but also um, observational data to investigate 
um, ocean dynamics around the main Hawaiian islands. And I'm really interested in how these dynamics impact ocean temperatures and nutrient circulation, and also how these dynamics may change as the climate changes. So really my research aims to contribute to these larger questions around kind of how will climate change impact the oceans and the coastal regions around Hawaii, and what does this mean for the ecosystems such as coral reefs that we depend on. My work contributes to multiple United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So by better understanding um, the current day dynamics, we're in a better place to identify um, climate-driven changes. And I also hope that my work can help provide some of the Hawaii-specific information about kind of climate change that decision makers here need to address sustainable development goals locally. So I would like to thank the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education um, for funding my work. It's allowed me to conduct my research, but also over the past year to travel um, and attend a summer school and an international conference where I presented my work, but also met with and learned from and developed connections with the wider research community. Also earlier this year, Jacob Gunnison and I were able to present some Hawaii-specific climate projections to the state legislature. So thank you uh, for the donation and for funding this work, and I'm really looking forward to continuing um, my research into the future. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a fourth year graduate student in physical oceanography. My advisor is Malta Stucker, and I work on climate variability. So hopefully you all know that the mean temperature of the oceans is going to go up, unfortunately. But what about variability? It's not so clear what is going to happen to those fluctuations around that rising mean. Um, and it's quite important because if a coral can, say, withstand one degree of warming, in the mean change, but there is a sudden temperature spike of two degrees on top of that, then you, know, you may have bleached the corals without um, you know, having reached a threshold based on the mean temperature of the ocean that might kill the corals. So I think work on climate variability, it's, it's not something people have done much before just because we haven't had the tools. Now we have these large ensemble climate models which allow us to get a really good picture of the internal variability of the climate system and allow us to make really good measurements of uh, how climate variability might change. Um, I'm very thankful to the Uihira Foundation for funding my research and those of my peers. I work mostly on the computer. This photo is a slight uh, exaggeration. I, I thought I would uh, you know, appear as a real physical oceanographer by taking a photo on a boat, but most of my research is on the computer. But to that end, um, it's really been helpful to get some new computer equipment with the funding that Uihira Foundation has provided. Um, and like Kate said, it's been very helpful to go to summer schools, conferences, workshops that I might not have been able to attend otherwise. Uh, in the summer, I went to a marine heat wave workshop in Italy, and it was a great experience. I connected with a lot of people, um, a lot of scientists who are doing similar work. And climate change is a global problem, so it's quite important to connect with people all across the globe. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this opening ceremony today. My name is Raina McClintock, and I am a first year PhD student here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. My advisor is Dr. Craig Nelson, and I work at the Center of Microbial Oceanographic Research and Education. My research topic is exploring the effectiveness of ocean alkalinity enhancement as a carbon sequestration technique and the resulting impacts on coral reef ecosystems. So this, ocean, or this carbon sequestration techniques works by increasing the buffering capacity of the ocean. So we may store more atmospheric carbon dioxide in the surface waters without decreasing the pH and increasing acidification. 
Through that process, we're also enhancing the amount of carbonate and bicarbonate available, which may benefit calcifying species. But it is very important that we understand all of the effects that this might have on our ecosystems. So my work hopes to explore the physiological, microbial, and settlement changes on coral reef ecosystems. This research directly relates to climate action, which is under the Sustainable Development Goal number 13, as well as ocean acidification mitigation, which is the in Sustainable Development Goal 14.3, as well as coral resilience, which is 14.2, through potential increasing calcification rates. I'd like to thank the Uehiro Foundation on Ethics and Education for this incredible opportunity. And um, I've, throughout this past year, I've been able to travel to the WSN conference and present some of my preliminary work on this alkalinity enhancement effect on coral settlement. So thank you so much. all coming. My name is Kyle Connor. I'm a PhD candidate in chemical oceanography advised, co-advised by Chris Sabine and Shiv Sharma. And my main research interests are in calcifying organisms that's been introduced by the previous speakers, and particularly how these calcifying organisms and their precipitated calcium carbonate structures are going to fare under different environmental conditions, which we anticipate will continue to be less favorable towards calcium carbonate precipitation into the future as we move on into the 21st century. A lot of my work is in the lab, uh, dealing with simulating conditions, changing temperature, changing carbonate chemistry conditions like pH, and seeing how the mineral, the, the mineral composition, the mineral and geochemical characteristics of the calcium carbonate changes. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of kind of growth of the calcium carbonate. There's a lot of analysis post-growth using these advanced uh, optical physics and geochemical techniques. Um, and the long-term goal is really to see, uh, with respect to the UN SDG goal 14.3, how ocean acidification is going to, um, again, impact the kind of carbon ion disorder um, of these calcium carbonates. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of lab work, a lot of instrumentation, which requires a lot of money to run. So my thanks to the Uehiro Foundation for making that possible. And I'm about to uh, present some of this work at a conference next week at AGU in San Francisco, which obviously would not be possible without the funding as well. So thank you very much. Sorry, a little shorter. <laughs> I'm Shannon Murphy. I am born and raised here in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I am a master's student um, en route to a PhD. And my research is advised by Dr. Andrea Yanni. My objective is to look at coral larval settlement cues induced by epiphytic bacterial assemblages on crustose coralline algae. So when corals broadcast spawn or brood larvae, those larvae are gonna use environmental cues to find substrate to attach to and metamorphose. It's believed that microbial biofilms that reside on calcifying red algae release organic compounds that the corals use as a cue. So I'm interested in taking this dynamic a little bit further. There's not a ton of research that has been done on it. Um, and I'd like to use this research to promote coral reef conservation and restoration through enhancing um, coral larval settlement. And this ties under the United Nations St Sustainable Development Goal 14 of Life Below Water. I would like to thank the Uehiro Foundation on Ethics and Education for this incredible opportunity. Um, not only has it been able to actually bring me to graduate school, but it has allowed me to uh, follow my passion and really choose a project that I'm interested in um, for the benefit of our islands. Thank you so much. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Indrian Gahigan, um, Adi for short. 
Um, I work with um, Greg Stewart. I'm, I'm uh, fascinated with tiny micro microscopic organism called phytoplankton. So what you're seeing here is a plankton net. The pore size is very small. It captures those tiny microscopic plants. Um, my UE Hero projects, uh, my project um, deals with harmful algal blooms. So something troubling is happening when we pollute our coastal waters. So what's happening is that um, the increase in nutrient triggers the, opportunist, the growth of opportunistic algae or plankton. So what I'm doing with this project is to deploy low cost tools and relatively advanced technologies to monitor and hopefully predict um, future blooms. Um, this project uh, hopefully will mitigate um, HABs and forward um, sustainable aquaculture practices. Um, um, I'm deeply grateful to the UEHERI Foundation because with this funding, we're able to deploy these low-cost tools and empower the coastal community to do, to do their own monitoring using um, these low-cost tools. So I'm excited to share the findings of that next year if we have the student symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Amanda Laughlin. I am a first year PhD student. I'm co-advised by Dr. Kyle Edwards and Dr. Greg Stewart, and I study marine viruses. So overall, my goal is to identify the various trade-offs between giant and tiny viruses and everything in between. Um, presently, I am focusing on grazing ability of myxotrophic phytoplankton on a broad range of virus sizes. And at this moment, I am working with giant viruses. Um, although this is my first year, so in the future, I hope to explore these goals even more. Um, and because viruses are the foundation of the entire marine ecosystem, it's incredibly important to understand how they function as well as how they interact with the rest of the system. So my research is going to hopefully shed more light on all of those things, and I really look forward to the work that can come out of this. And as Shannon mentioned, um, this, fe this fellowship has brought me to grad school, so I'm incredibly grateful, um, and I wanna give a massive thank you to the Uihiro Foundation on Ethics and Education. And I hope to use this money as well to, like some of my colleagues said, continue networking, present my research at conferences, and hopefully, produce a ton of good research that helps us learn more about these tiny, tiny little, little guys. <laughs> uh, thank you. Three of our students couldn't be here today. They are distributed across the globe from Antarctica to the Labrador Sea. So Mandy Toparoff, the center's creative outreach director, has put together videos uh, of the students and their work. At the University of Hawaii at Manila. I'm a fourth year PhD student working with Dr. Dan Paco and the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program. My research focuses on understanding the drivers of the iron cycle and how these change over time. In order to measure the changes in iron cycling over time, I go to sea about once a month from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program. We go to Spatial Aloha, which is an oceanographic site around 100 kilometers offshore of Oahu. It can be really challenging to measure iron and other trace metals while on a ship due to the low concentrations in the ocean and the high risk of contamination. To address this, I use the trace metal piece PTE rosette to measure the vertical profiles of dissolved and particulate iron. I also use trace metal piece sediment traps to measure the amount of iron sinking out of the upper ocean. All of these samples are then taken to a clean lab on board where they can safely be collected and processed. From these measurements, we can calculate things like resonance time, or how long iron stays in the upper ocean available for organisms to use where it sinks out. Here we've estimated that the residence time is around six months, so 
so the ecosystem needs to continually supply of iron in order to function. We can look at how much iron is coming from natural sources, such as the deposition of dust, versus human sources, such as fossil fuel burning. This research directly supports the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of limiting marine pollution from land-based activities by identifying and quantifying one area of marine nutrient pollution. Additionally, improving our understanding of the marine iron cycle can help improve global climate models to help predict future changes in climate. I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation and the Kiro Foundation on Ethics and Education for funding this work. Because of this support, 
I can concentrate on studying and my research and have had many opportunities to learn and meet new people. Thank you very much to Radio Foundation for this support. この先端の研究のドクトロの開発に海洋学の立場から貢献することを目標として設立されました。この先端に所属する意見として現在地球が直面している社会的課題に対して議論し研究しそして社会に還元できるように報道できることは光栄であり誇りに思います。そして私が現